A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain, Chapter 40, Part 2. Quick, I shouted to Clarence, telephone the king's homeopath to come. In two minutes I was kneeling by the child's crib and Sandy was dispatching servants here, there and everywhere all over the palace. I took in the situation almost at a glance. Membranous croup. I bent down and whispered, Wake up, sweetheart. Hello, Central. She opened her soft eyes languidly and made out to say, Papa. That was a comfort. She was far from dead, yet I sent for preparations of sulphur. I roused it out the croup kettle myself, for I don't sit down and wait for doctors when Sandy or the child is sick. I knew how to nurse both of them and had had experience. This little chap had lived in my arms a good part of its small life, and often I could soothe away its troubles and get it to laugh through the tear dews on its eyelashes when even its mother couldn't. Sir Launcelot, in his richest armour, came striding along the great hall now on his way to the stock board. He was president of the stock board and occupied the siege perilous which he had bought of Sir Galahad, for the stock board consisted of the knights of the round table and they used the round table for business purposes now. Seats at it were worth, well, you would never believe the figure so it is no use to state it. Sir Launcelot was a bear and he had put up a corner in one of the new lines and was just getting ready to squeeze the shorts today, but what of that? He was the same old Lancelot, and when he glanced in as he was passing the door and found out that his pet was sick, that was enough for him. Bulls and bears might fight it out their own way for all him. He would come right in here and stand by little Hello Central for all he was worth. And that was what he did. He shied his helmet into the corner and in half a minute he had a new wick in the alcohol lamp and was firing up on the croup kettle. By this time, Sandy had built a blanket canopy over the crib and everything was ready. Sir Lancelot got up steam. He and I loaded up the kettle with unslaked lime and carbolic acid with a touch of lactic acid added there too, then filled the thing up with water and inserted the steam spout under the canopy. Everything was ship-shaped now, and we sat down on either side of the crib to stand our watch. Sandy was so grateful and so comforted that she charged a couple of church wardens with willow bark and summock tobacco for us and told us to smoke as much as we pleased. It couldn't get under the canopy, and she was used to smoke being the first lady in the land who had ever seen a cloud blown. Well, there couldn't be a more contented or comfortable sight than Sir Launcelot in his noble armour, sitting in gracious serenity at the end of a yard of snowy church warden. He was a beautiful man, a lovely man, and was just intended to make a wife and children happy. But of course, Guinevere, however... It is no use to cry over what's done and can't be helped. Well, he stood watch and watch with me right straight through for three days and nights till the child was out of danger. Then he took her up in his great arms and kissed her with his plumes falling about her golden head, then laid her softly in Sandy's lap again and took his stately way down the vast hall between the ranks of admiring men-at-arms and maniles, and so disappeared. 
and no instinct warned me that I should never look upon him again in this world. Lord, what a world of heartbreak it is. The doctor said we must take the child away if we would coax her back to health and strength again, and she must have sea air. So we took a man of war and a suit of 260 persons and went cruising about. And after a fortnight of this, we stepped ashore on the French coast, and the doctors thought it would be a good idea to make something of a stay there. The little king of that region offered us his hospitalities, and we were glad to accept. If he had had as many conveniences as he lacked, we should have been plenty comfortable enough. Even as it was, we made out very well in this queer old castle by the help of comforts and luxuries from the ship. At the end of a month, I sent the vessel home for fresh supplies and for news. We expected her back in three or four days. She would bring, bring me, along with other news, the result of a certain experiment which I had been starting. It was a project of mine to replace the tournament with something which might furnish an escape for the extra steam of the chivalry. Keep those bucks entertained and out of mischief and at the same time preserve the best thing in them, which was their hardy spirit of emulation. I had had a choice band of them in private training for some time and the date was now arriving for their first public effort. This experiment was baseball. In order to give the thing folk from the start and place it out of the reach of criticism, I chose my nines by rank, not capacity. There wasn't a knight in either team who wasn't a sceptered sovereign. As for material of this sort, there was a glut of it always around Arthur. You couldn't throw a brick in any direction and not cripple a king. Of course... I couldn't get these people to leave off their armor, and they wouldn't do that when they bathed. They consented to differentiate the armor so that a body could tell one team from the other. But that was the most they would do. So one of the teams wore chain mail ulsters and the other wore plate armor made of my new Bessemer steel. Their practice in the field was the most fantastic thing I ever saw. Being ball-proof, they never skipped out of the way, but stood still and took the result. When a Bessemer was at the bat and a ball hit him, it would bound a hundred and fifty yards sometimes. And when a man was running and threw himself on his stomach to slide to his base, it was like an ironclad coming into port. At first I appointed men of no rank to act as umpires, but I had to discontinue that. These people were no easier to please than other nines. The umpire's first decision was usually his last. They broke him in two with a bat, and his friends toted him, toted him home on a shutter. When it was noticed that no umpire ever survived a game, umpiring got to be unpopular, so I was obliged to appoint somebody whose rank and lofty position under the government would protect him. Here are the names of the nines. Bessemer Alsters, King Arthur, King Lot of Lothian, King of North Galice, King Marcel, King of Little Britain, King Labour, King Pelham of Listengees, King Badgemagus, King Ptolemy Le Feint, Emperor Lucius, King Logris, King Marhalt of Ireland, King Morganor, King Mark of Cornwall, King Nantre of Garlot, 
King Melodius of Lyon, King of the Lake, the Snowden of Syria. Umpire, Clarence. The first public game would certainly draw 50,000 people and for solid fun would be worth going around the world to see. Everything would be favorable. It was balmy and beautiful spring weather now and nature was all tailored out in her new clothes. So, that was chapter 40. Bye-bye. Till next time with chapter 41, The Interdict. <laughs>